Welcome to Season 1 of Press the Button. As part of this 10-episode season called Taking Back the Narrative, we are handing the microphone to members of communities affected by nuclear weapons so they can share their stories and their experiences in the ways they want them to be told. Today's guests are Trisha thompson Predikin and Dr. Yuki Miyamoto. Trisha is a Hanford downwinder and author of the book, The Hanford Plaintiffs, and Dr. Yuki Miyamoto is a professor at DePaul University and a second-generation Hiroshima Habakusha. They discuss the similarities between the Hanford downwinders and the Fukushima Daiichi downwinders and how radioactive iodine can impact the body. And then next week, they'll both be back to discuss the litigation process in both of these cases and the toll this has taken on survivors. It begins in 1943 in eastern Washington state, where the Hanford plant was created to produce plutonium for the Manhattan Project. Two-thirds of the plutonium in the U.S. nuclear weapons stockpile came from Hanford, including materials for the Trinity test and the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The public only learned of the extent of radioactive iodine emissions from the Hanford plant in 1986, after thousands of records were declassified by the Department of Energy, 44 years after off-site emissions began. The DOE only responded after intense public pressure. The CDC found three times more thyroid diseases among Hanford downwinders than expected when it was reviewed of its original study. The list include, but is not limited to, thyroid cancer, particularly high in children, which is uncommon, hyperthyroidism, hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's, and autoimmune thyroiditis. On March 11, 2011, a massive earthquake off northeast Japan triggered a tsunami that caused three reactors at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant to explode, exposing civilians in the area to radiation. Those exposed who now have thyroid cancer had no prior history in their family of thyroid cancer and were not informed about their exposure until weeks after the fact. In both of these cases, those exposed were not aware of the exposure until it was too late. Tresha thompson Pritikin and Dr. Yuki Miyamoto will be our guests today in this two-part series. Tresha is a Hanford downwinder and an internationally recognized advocate for those exposed to the Hanford off-site radiation releases. In addition, she wrote a book titled The Hanford Plaintiffs, which recently was translated and released in Japan. Dr. Yuki Miyamoto translated this book into Japanese. She is a professor at DePaul University where she uses comparative ethical framework to examine nuclear discourse and environmental ethics. She is also a second-generation Hiroshima Habakusha. Thank you both for joining me today. So, Trisha, who are the Hanford Downwinders? Hanford was uh, located along the Columbia River in uh, eastern Washington. And as you mentioned, it was established or uh, built over a period, very fast period of time and began operating in late 1944. From the beginning of operations, the site released to the air and the water millions of curies of radiation, including radioiodine, which will be important when we're discussing Fukushima. But just to be clear, that's not the only biologically significant radionuclide released, and it's also true in Fukushima. That was not the only damaging radionuclide released. So Hanford Downwinders refers to people who lived either downwind or downriver of the Hanford site during that period of time, although you didn't have to live there the whole period of time, the whole 40 years to become ill. And the uh, airborne radiation went all the way through eastern Washington into British Columbia, across Idaho, into western Montana, and northern Oregon. So it was a very wide area. And then the downriver people who are still called downwinders, <laughs> all the way down the Columbia River from Hanford to the mouth of the Columbia, there were communities impacted. And Yuki, who are the Fukushima Daiichi downwinders? Thank you for asking. Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant is located approximately 150 kilometers north of Tokyo, which is 240 miles north of Tokyo. And ironically, the electricity, which was generated by the Fukushima Daiichi, was not being consumed in Fukushima. It was sent to Tokyo to support metropolitan lifestyle there. And on March 11, 2011, the nuclear power plants, because of a tsunami earthquake, the reactor had meltdowns, three reactors had meltdowns, and that's how radioactive materials were spewed from the reactors. And 
since the plumes spread wider beyond the Fukushima prefecture borders, and the Japanese government had the data where the plume was going, but they didn't share it with the people. So some people actually fled into the direction that the plume was going. And later, hot spots were found in many prefectures surrounding Fukushima, including Tokyo. So there are many who were affected by the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant accident, but they may not even know or identify themselves with downwinders. Trisha, can you talk about the similarities in the fallout exposure to Hanford and Fukushima? And in the retrospective, how did the government respond to those exposures? Okay, that's a great question. One reason that Yuki and I in particular and the publishing house, which I'm very thankful for in Japan, wanted this book translated is there are many similarities in the exposures between the two populations. So we are hoping that our stories of the Hanford Downwinders will be extra evidence to help the young thyroid cancer plaintiffs in the litigation. It's called the 311 for March 2011 litigation. So the similarities are, first of all, radioactive iodine was released in both instances, although, as I mentioned before, there were other harmful radionuclides. It's just that they are not the subject of the litigation. But, you know, it deserves to be monitored and those people deserve to be followed to see what else comes up. Because like in the stories in the Hanford plaintiffs, you'll see other diseases that have popped up later in a lot of us that are repeated. Secondly, let me talk about radioiodine and what it does in the body, too, because that's important. From what I've read, and Yuki can correct me on this if I'm wrong, but what we're seeing in Fukushima now is young people with thyroid cancer and probably thyroid disease, which hasn't become thyroid cancer yet. But I'll tell you, from my own experience, having autoimmune thyroiditis from childhood exposure to radioiodine downwind of Hanford, it was an autoimmune thyroiditis, which means I went from hyperthyroid to hypo, to hyper to hypo, without anybody knowing what was wrong with me, because nobody told us until 1986 that anything had been released from Hanford. So I was sick and the doctors didn't know what was wrong. And hypothyroidism can cause severe headaches, muscle cramps, extreme fatigue, hair loss, unexplained weight gain, a feeling of weird graininess in the head, indigestion, brain fog. This makes you very dysfunctional. And if you're a student, as I was at the time when I got really sick, you almost have to drop out of school or just cut down on your workload. It cuts your earning ability. It cuts your chance to advance in your career. It's huge. Now, hyperthyroidism can include panic attacks where the body just becomes drenched in sweat, tachycardia, which is a really fast heart rate, unexplained weight loss, chest pain, muscle contractions, dizziness. And if these conditions are not treated, you know, you could go into a coma. So the people I'm reading about in Fukushima seem to have already, you know, after a latency period, have developed a thyroid cancer, which is already impacting their lives, their young lives. And they have a big probably have a big scar across their neck, which is stigma, because it labels you as a person who has been exposed. So just wanted to mention that. I mean, you'd ask for other similarities. Neither group of downwinders, I'm talking about Fukushima downwinders or Hanford, was told that they were in danger. As Yuki just mentioned, some of the people were trying to get out of the way of the fallout once they learned about it and actually ended up going right into the fallout because there wasn't any information on where it was going. And then a lot of folks just ended up staying there because they didn't have anywhere else to go. They didn't know they should go. The government wasn't being honest with them. So both of us were kept in the dark. The Hanford downwinders until 1986. And in our case, just I'll speak to Hanford and have Yuki speak to Fukushima, but it was only because people started getting sick across from Hanford, across the river, in the farmlands. And Karen Doran Steele, who was a young reporter with the Spokesman Review, started writing up their stories. Otherwise, no one would have known what was happening downwind of Hanford. And the stories started to mount and the people started to worry that there might be something wrong. There were also sheep deaths in the early 60s, which were very much like the sheep deaths that occurred near Cedar City in 1953 after a huge atomic test from the Nevada test site. So that's Two, and the third 
real big similarity is the government and the nuclear industry deny any causal link between the fallout and the thyroid cancer or any other radiogenic disease. That's true in both places. So the community was not aware of this for decades. What could have happened if it was communicated to the community what was happening compared to how the plant was communicating to its staff and internally to the government? I've actually been doing a lot of research on that lately. First of all, there was a public health official in Benton County, which is the closest in county to Hanford, who recommended that the public be told to use iodized table salt or to take a non-radioactive iodine pill every day because that would block the radioiodine from being uptaken. So the public health department knew there was a risk and the Department of not the Department of Energy, it was the Atomic Energy Commission back then, refused to recommend any of these very simple and inexpensive health protective measures because they worried it would alarm the public. I just wanted to mention that. That's really outrageous. It would have protected the thyroids of children. In fact, there is one person named Tom Bailey who lived across the Columbia River on one of the farms, and his mother knew about the iodine releases from Hanford because she had been a typist for Robert Oppenheimer here at UC Berkeley. So she gave her children something every day. We think it was probably a non-radioactive iodine pill, and none of them have thyroid problems now. Everyone around them has thyroid cancer, thyroid disease. See, so it could have been very protective. But in my own case, which is fairly interesting and very sort of typical, I would have had a much different life had I been diagnosed earlier. As the years went on, the thyroid disease got worse and worse. My thyroid was dying and it really, it caused me to have what looked like a heart attack while I was in law school here in San Francisco. They hauled me to the hospital and found out it was a contraction of my esophagus because of the inflamed thyroid. I kept going back to doctors and they didn't know what was wrong. But if the Department of Energy had come clean earlier, A lot of the people who had my problems or all the women who had the difficulties with fertility, stillbirths, being unable to carry pregnancies to term, a lot of that is related, if you read the literature, to severe thyroid disease. So that is a huge price for a woman to pay, you know, inability to bear a child. And right now, if you go to Walla Walla, Spokane, or... Casco or Richland, you'll see baby graves, so many baby graves, rows of them, because of all the deaths, the neo spike of neonatal deaths in the area. That included my older brother. So a lot of that could have been prevented if the Atomic Energy Commission had just had a little faith in the public to make our own decisions. You know, they were worried that if they told people what the problem was, that everybody would flee and there wouldn't be any workers. Well, my contention is that if you told everybody, some people would have fled. But a lot of them would have decided to take the risk and use those two simple health measures and stayed. Either they didn't even trust us enough to make that decision. So I just want to say, Tricia, I'm so sorry and I appreciate you taking this time because having to be an advocate for yourself, it's you are re-traumatizing yourself by telling your story so people know because in cases like this, it is unfortunately the burden that's placed on you guys to share your stories, to educate the public because the government's not educating the public on what was being done to these communities. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, I feel deeply for the young Fukushima plaintiffs because they face more stigma there, from what I understand, than we do. I mean, we do have some stigma. We have a lot of burdens and barriers, but maybe you can talk about how hard it is for people to speak up in Japan about what's happened to them. Sure. As Trisha said, If the community had been informed, things would have been different. You know, now it's 2011 and this year is 2023. And after Chernobyl, people knew the causal relationship between radiation exposure and thyroid cancer or thyroid diseases. So the community had some kind of knowledge about it. But there is huge pressure from the government and TEPCO and I guess other authorities do not admit to it or would like to deny it or at least to dismiss it or downplay it. And the government officials, scientists, and including scientists, were saying that there were no causal uh, relationships between radiation exposure and thyroid cancers. 
But what happened was the Fukushima prefecture started having the screening ultrasound echo scan on thyroid. And up to 2022, last year, close to 260 children were diagnosed with thyroid cancer. I think this year, according to one site, it exceeds 300. So those children were suffering, but however, some scientists, government officials are still in denial by saying that this is because excess of screening. Uh, We are over-diagnosing. But it's very obvious that, you know, Tricia is often saying that among children, the rate of cancer, thyroid cancer, is one or two out of a million, million kids. So given that number, 300 kids in the past 10 years, that's way too excessive. It's not about over-screening. However, the advertised company also got so much money from the government and coming into high school and telling them like how safe things are. So that kind of education, advertisement, TV commercial, and everything is geared toward how safe this is. And if you are saying you are sick, then you would be criticized. Well, you are saying that this is not safe. We are living, you know, the place we are living. So you are against the restoration of Fukushima or you are spreading the rumor of Fukushima being dangerous. And it's, of course, impacting economy and you are ruining everything. So it's very hard to talk about your health condition or even anxieties. You might get some day, you might have thyroid disease in the future, you can't even talk about it. I just want to say thank you both for sharing that. And on paper, people would not, if they think about this, the fact that there are so many parallels and similarities years after the fact, and we still haven't learned this lesson. And the people who are front and center being impacted are those who have no say in this process. And they are the ones who are suffering the consequences and being told and denied. So on that note, has there been government-funded studies of the health effects of either of these sites? And have there been independently-led studies as well? I wanted to mention what happened that relates to the question you're asking. In 1986, when all like six feet uh, tall pile of classified early operating records from Hanford was given to the public after a lot of public pressure, by the Department of Energy. And then the governors of Washington and Oregon, and along with tribal members, set up a historical documents review committee, which hoped to lead what's called a dose reconstruction effort. This is really important to what's happening to everybody at Fukushima, here, Hanford. The dose reconstruction is required because people, civilians, exposures are not measured when something happens, like a nuclear reactor meltdown or at Hanford. And why is that? Because it's so much easier for the government if they don't measure it. And it's so much easier to deny anything happened if you don't have any, you know, a Geiger countermeasure or a whole body countermeasure. So what happened is the Department of Energy announced it would fund its own dose reconstruction study. And due to, quote unquote, emerging litigation from people who had been exposed, so you could see it was set up as a litigation defense to start with. So this is the cards were already stacked against us. This ended up as the Hampered Environmental Dose Reconstruction Study. And dose reconstruction is important to the litigation both for Hanford and Fukushima because that's the only way to know how much a person was more or less exposed to, even though it's very uncertain. And at Hanford, to prove the causal link, you had to have a high enough header dose, Hanford Environmental Dose Reconstruction dose, to show that your cancer, let's say thyroid cancer, was more likely than not caused by the fallout. It's a real hurdle for people, for toxic tort plaintiffs. We'll talk about that a little later. So I just want to mention that we too had supposedly were going to be monitored. Um, It was the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, which is part of the CDC, recommended in 1997 that they would provide medical monitoring for up to 14,000 people, including me, (laughs) exposed to Hanford radiation. We were the highest risk. I was there right in the middle of it all, right, when they were letting everything out. But the Department of Energy 
who was supposed to fund it under Superfund law, refused to fund the medical monitoring. So I sued them. Long story short, I lost because of a ruling that said that the downwinders lacked standing to sue the DOE. We were supposed to sue the ATSDR first, and then they were supposed You know, it's really complicated when you're trying to get one federal agency to fund a program of another federal agency. So no medical monitoring. But when they did the Hanford thyroid disease study, which took place, I can't remember exactly the year it started, but they looked at people born between 40 and I think 47, a whole bunch of people. And it was deemed a study that showed no health effects from Hanford radiation. Everybody was very upset. And so we had an extended review by the National Academies of Science, which deemed the study to have too much uncertainty in its doses, which is I was just talking about. And it deemed the study inconclusive. It was also very much out of line with all the other studies of people exposed to I-131. Chernobyl, Nevada test site, Marshall Islands, they all show increased incidence of thyroid disease and cancer, which I think the Fukushima litigation will has to show because that's what happened. So I would like to add a little bit about the Fukushima case. The Fukushima prefecture, as I said, has been conducting this ultrasound scan over the thyroid and stuff. But the government, both the central and the municipal government, would like to stop it, the seas, this scanning, because it evokes anxieties among people. And actually people, residents, some residents would like to stop it. You know, of course, others would like to continue because that's important. But the number of the people who are taking the scanning or screening is declining. And partly because those screening are designed for the people who were kids at the time of the meltdown. And they were now in the 20s. And so some of them are not living in Fukushima or it's hard for them to take some time out from their job and to take the screen. So because of those reasons, the number is declining. And But still, there are a few groups. Besides the government, there are a few groups and NGOs who are conducting the screening for people, for children as well as for adults. So that's good. But other things is monitoring the posts. There are some monitoring posts who are set up throughout Fukushima, and which is not sufficient, as we know. It's only detect radioactive materials in the air or airborne radiation, radioactive materials. So when you have kids, kids like to play with the soil and, you know, they are shorter and they are close to the ground. For them, the measurement is much higher than the monitoring posts would tell. But nonetheless, it's better than nothing. But before the Olympics, there was a discussion that we should remove all the monitoring posts because the government didn't want to leave any evidence or residue of the meltdown accidents. But some people really opposed to that plan. And so we still have monitoring posts, but it's always constant struggle to leave the evidence behind or to leave the record, which is very important. And I'm very grateful that Hanford litigation took place because that litigation itself is a great proof and evidence for the people after them. Thank you both. And I think these similarities are striking and infuriating that this is happening years later. So please stay tuned for the rest of this conversation that will be happening next week about the litigation process going forward and what happened in the past. So thank you. Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced and edited in Washington, D.C. by Alex Hall, Angela Kellett, and Loan Billet, and in San Francisco by Charles Crosby. Audio engineering by Jacqueline Shing. Our theme song is Black Nymph by Peridot. To continue the dialogue and support our work, visit plowshares.org.